Junior played baseball at school, but he wasn't the star on the team. He was good at his schoolwork, but he wasn't the, the, the smart person in the class. He was just average. So there was nothing that stood out. There was nothing that said that this family would be the family that would produce a serial killer. To the outside world, the Yates's were a happy, contented, all-American family. In many ways, Yates's relationship with his father was completely normal. Usually it's thought that even one positive role model is sufficient to stop people from becoming seriously psychiatrically disturbed, and yet it didn't do anything here. We have to ask ourselves the question, why? When investigators dug into Yates' family history, they discovered something shocking. We learned that his grandmother killed his grandfather, and there was some violence in the family, obviously. Uh, his grandmother didn't just kill his grandfather, but she killed him in a especially gruesome way. She took an ax to him, actually. And then was committed to a mental institution. And that becomes, I suspect, an intergenerational message, which is women are very dangerous. They have what you want, but they're very dangerous people. While there was a violent history in the family, Yates himself allegedly suffered some trauma when he was just six years old. We often find in serial killers that that violence is actually rooted in shame. That shame is often something that has happened during the childhood, something that the child felt they had no control over, but something that they felt judged by, something that, that made them feel less worthy. Robert Lee Yates was sexually assaulted by another child who was a neighbor. But Yates kept the assault a secret. The incident was never reported to police. After graduating high school, Yates met his first wife. In 1972, age 20, Yates and his wife moved to the small town of Walla Walla in Washington State, where they enrolled in college. There, he spent his free time alone in the woods, hunting, hiking, and fishing. The parents of his wife, years later, say actually he was quite a loner. We never really got to know him. Even though he was married to their daughter, he was somebody who was quite insular. And it's that constant theme of invisibility. Yates's marriage to his first wife ended in divorce just 18 months later. However, he had already begun a new relationship with another woman. In December that year, Yates got a job at the Washington State Penitentiary, and the first of their five children was born. It wouldn't surprise me if he'd been fantasizing about this for quite some time. And he comes across two college graduates, and he decides that he's going to kill them. And that's what he does. He literally shoots them in cold blood. A rage burst out. He acted entirely instinctively and shot them both. It is unimaginable. Why would you do that? There is something profoundly out of kilter in Yates's personality. For Yates, simply murdering the young friends was not enough. He placed the body of Susan on top of that of Patrick, and Susan's body, he'd removed a lot of her clothing. So this is really humiliating. This is really demeaning. Yates left the bodies by the side of the creek and covered them with a pile of rubbish, a sleeping bag, and an old tire. Yates essentially assassinates them. And what his motivation was is, I mean, it's anyone's guess. Yates's flying career was quickly put on hold as his medical results were being processed. He's grounded, he's not allowed to fly his helicopter. Now, this is a pivotal moment for me because somebody else has taken control, somebody else has made that decision. He's not the one that's in the driving seat anymore. Despite not initially being able to fly, he remains in the National Guard. But with a large family to support, he takes on a menial job at a manufacturing plant in Spokane. And all the while, Yates continued to kill. I think the murders that he committed were an attempt to get back control. I think there were things happening in his life that he felt were out of his control, and he wanted to feel powerful again. His new hunting ground was the seedy strip in downtown Spokane, known as The Track. Prostitutes to Yates were easy targets in that they would get into his vehicle without any questions asked. They would just 
decide about what money was going to be exchanged for services. And the prostitutes were very vulnerable because most of them were drug addicts and they'd sell themselves for money and use it to buy drugs. Robert Lee Yates was very much a regular face on the, the sex workers scene in, in this part of town at the time. So he wouldn't just pick up women to have sex with, he would do drugs with them. He became part of their community. And I think he would be trusted by them. He was somebody that they knew. In the summer of 1997, Yates picked up 20-year-old Heather from the downtown track to have sex with her. But I suspect that the victims may not have known even the second before they died that this was going to be a killing. Because I suspect their interaction went down much as an interaction with a prostitute goes down. And then when he was done, he draws his gun and he shoots. Yates shot Heather in the head with a 22 caliber handgun. Literally, there's just a second that the victim becomes aware that something's amiss, and after that, the victim is dead. After Yates murdered Heather, he dumped her body on the side of the road. Well, he was brazen in his thought as far as dumping the bodies. In August that year, Yates was back on the track looking for easy prey. He picked up 16-year-old Jennifer. Like the young woman before her, her fate was a foregone conclusion. Unlike many serial killers, the way that Yates kills is instrumental. He has sex with his victims, and then he pulls out a gun and he shoots them. They die virtually instantaneously at the hand of somebody who knows how to use weapons effectively. He's not trying to torture. He's not trying to terrorize. He's simply eliminating the witness. He watches as the life literally drains from them. And this is an individual who's is not going to stop because his offending is getting worse. It's becoming more sadistic. Once dead, Yates prepared to move Jennifer's body, a ritual he would repeat time and time again. After shooting them in the heads, he put bags over their head, largely uh, to keep his car clean. I mean, he didn't want the blood dri dripping out and would put plastic bags over their heads to to keep the mess off his car. Ten days later, local farmers found Jennifer's badly decomposed body. It had been dumped in brush northeast of Spokane. This site where Jennifer was found, it was next to a working farm near to a, an alfalfa field. Investigators also found a number of bloodstains. When tested, they revealed DNA belonging to Jennifer. They knew that her murder had been in that vehicle before she'd been dumped in a field northwest of Spokane. All of the evidence is starting to match up, and it leads them right back to Robert Lee Yates. The task force put in a warrant for Yates's arrest. By the time the detectives get a warrant for his arrest, they are 100% certain they've got the right man. On April the 17th of 2000, the task force put Yates under 24-hour surveillance. The police had staked out the family home, um, made sure that he was there, and after he left for work uh, at 6 o'clock the, the following morning, they moved in and they arrested him. The same day, detectives searched Yates's house for further evidence. Immediately after his arrest, a sample of Yates's DNA was taken and compared with samples collected from a number of murder victims found between 1996 and 1998. It was tested that day and came back late that afternoon. I recall that we were at the Yates home conducting a search when we got word that the DNA matched Robert Yates. At least eight of the victims had the same DNA found on them, so we knew we were dealing with a serial killer. All the investigators were very happy. We were actually elated. The day after Yates was apprehended, a newspaper report was released detailing his arrest. Upon seeing it, former sex worker Christine Smith instantly recognized Yates as being the man who shot her in the back of his van in August of 1998. At the time of the incident, she thought she'd been stabbed and had reported it to police. 
it wasn't until uh, a couple of years later when she was involved in a car wreck that she went to the hospital and they discovered shrapnel in her head and then she realizes that she's actually been shot she hasn't been stabbed somebody has held a gun to her head and pulled the trigger and not only that this person who's done this is Robert Lee Yates, and she realizes I could have been one of his victims. Christine's evidence helped connect the final pieces of the puzzle. Her coming forward was very crucial to the task force. She came forward, provided the information to law enforcement, and she was a, a living victim, if you will. It's a living person that could testify against Robert Yates. A month later, in May of 2000, investigators meticulously searched Yates's black van. They discovered blood pertaining to two other victims, three bullet holes and spent bullets and bullet debris containing Christine's DNA. When the task force finally got to her, they had the bullet fragment surgically removed and it ballistically matched up to the same weapon that was used in some of these other killings. While searching Yates's property, investigators discovered the murder weapons. He used handguns. Some of the victims may also have been killed with a 22, but most of the murders were committed by a 25 caliber handgun. The task force now had enough evidence to charge him with a total of 13 murders and the attempted murder of Christine Smith. In October of 2000 at the Spokane Superior Court, Yates faced his charges. In front of a packed room, the serial killer took to the stand and made a shock plea. Yates, to the surprise of many, goes to court and pleads guilty to 13 counts of murder and one count of attempted murder. The callous killer avoided going to trial by pleading guilty to the murders. So Bobby Joe Long's mother used to work in bars. She was single, she was on her own with him, and she had to go out and work, she was the breadwinner. As a child, Long suffered many accidents, head injuries that caused several periods of unconsciousness. Some were minor, like falling from a swing. Others were more serious, falling downstairs and being thrown from a horse. One of his most serious injuries occurred at the age of seven when he was hit by a car. The accident left him with a deformed jaw and teeth. And the kids would worry him to death about that. And, uh, and he finally had an operation on that as well. He wore those scars, you know, all of his life. With money scarce, they live frugally in a one bedroom apartment even sharing a single bed until Bobby Joe was a teenager. Bobby Joe confided in his ex-wife, Cindy, about his relationship with his mother. He would tell me that certain nights that she would come home with a, a boyfriend, that he would get woke up and put on the couch while the boyfriend spent the night with her. Long slept with his mother, which often angered him when she brought home a man of which there are string and I think it's in there somewhere that the genesis of Long's loathing for women began. When you look at how he speaks about his mother and, and what he thought about her, he held her in, in quite a lot of contempt and disdain. He said some very offensive things about her. He criticised the fact that she worked as a barmaid, that she wore revealing outfits. And, and that, for me, says that he's got some incredibly fixed and, and very conservative views about women, who they are, how they should behave. They should look after their husbands, look after their children. He's got a very fixed idea of, of, of men as breadwinners and, and women as caregivers. Long harboured a grudge against his mother for not looking after him or paying him enough attention. He had a horrible resentment towards his mother. And to be very honest with you, had I have ever heard that he you know, had harmed his mom, I probably wouldn't have been surprised because he really did have a hate for his mother. And uh, as time went on, uh, the more time she, she paid to men, uh, the more he resented it. And, and psychiatrists have said that that's part of his problem, that, that he was actually killing his mother. Again and again, he hated women. Long had also been born with a condition that would later in life prove a challenge to his masculinity. He had Kleinfelter syndrome, which meant that he had two X chromosomes and one Y 
Now, one of the symptoms of that is it gives a young boy, as he grows into, into adolescence, significant extra estrogen. High levels of the female hormone can result in men developing enlarged breast tissue called gynecomastia. This happened to Bobby Joe Long, to his great embarrassment, and I think also heightened the fact that he loathed women. Age 13, Bobby Joe Long underwent surgery to remove his breasts, leaving ugly scars that made the young man very self-conscious about his body. When we were kids, you know, we were always swimming at, down in the Keys and everything. He would always keep a shirt on because he was embarrassed of the scars from the surgery. By his early teens, this cocktail of anger at his mother and his own physical self-loathing was already beginning to turn Bobby Joe Long into an angry young man. Bobby Joe Long had a fresh hunting ground of Tampa Bay, where just raping and abusing women was no longer enough. He would go from being the classified ad rapist into a serial killer. Divorced from his wife, Bobby Joe Long began his sadistic murderous spree. Preying on vulnerable young women in the red light district, his need for sexual gratification was insatiable. On the 10th of May, 1984, exotic dancer Lana had arranged to meet her boyfriend after work and was walking along the strip. Lana was an Asian. She was a pole dancer in a bar on the strip. Uh, she, uh, she had relocated from California, and she had a boyfriend. She was often asked to go home, you know, to be taken home, but she didn't usually do that, even though that was extra money. Bobby Joe Long came along in the car, and he stopped the car and asked her if she'd like a ride. She got into the car, and that was his first known victim in that killing frenzied period. Lana's body was found three days later by two boys near East Bay Road, Tampa. She'd been brutally raped, strangled, and her body grotesquely posed. She had the hangman's noose around her neck, and she was cut while that, all that was going on. It was out of control. The, the, the ligatures showed signs of, of, of a knife, and he just left her in the field. This was, was one of those, those cases where you have this first murder and the, the individual who's been killed is associated with the sex work trade, is, is somebody who's seen as less deserving. And very often these murders don't get the same attention, don't get the, the same kind of investigation as others. So very often these first murders are real opportunities to apprehend a serial killer before they kill again. On the 26th of May, Long struck once again. He picked up 22-year-old sex worker Michelle on the strip. Michelle was a beauty queen at one time, and, and she was very pretty, but she was a drug addict, and, uh, and so she did that to support her, uh, her habit. After she got in the car, Long drove to Park Road, known as the local lover's lane. He tied her up, beat her, and viciously raped her, and then threw her out of the car. But Michelle was still alive. This victim has got spirit, and she puts up a fantastic fight, which makes him extremely angry. So angry, indeed, that he not only does he try and strangle her, he then goes on to cut her throat viciously. So he cut the throat of one victim. He really didn't care. He wanted to, to get his pleasure, have his fun, and then just simply dispose of these women. When you're getting to that level of brutality, we are beyond simply ending a life. We are into cruelty. We are into doing things for Long's own perverted pleasure. And that, to my mind, is evil. Strangulation and the use of ligatures became Long's killing trademarks. He used ropes and a series of knots to create a collar like a hangman's noose. With strangulation, you're very physically close and you have complete control. You have ownership of that other person while you're strangling them. And 
you know you have power of life and death literally in your hands. Michelle's body was found a day later in an isolated area of Hillsborough County by a construction worker. There was no indication that Long selected women of a physical type, but during his eight-month killing spree, all of his victims were young women and the majority were sex workers. The net is closing very quickly around Long. They were not going to let this guy commit yet another murder. And they followed him to a movie theatre one day, and he went in and he watched a film, and the police waited outside for, for him to come out. On November the 16th, 1984, Long was arrested outside a movie theatre. His Dodge Magnum was seized, and a sample of the red carpet from the vehicle was immediately submitted to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement Crime Lab. When questioned about the abduction and rape of Lisa, he quickly confessed. You said something earlier, okay? About the reason you let go. And what would happen as a result of letting her go. Do you want to say that again? I knew it would lead to me getting caught. I just knew it would. I just knew it would. I knew she saw me. And I had a pretty good idea she could see underneath the blindfolds. And it was a real tug of war trying to decide if I should let her go or not. But I didn't want to hurt her. But when he was interviewed about the eight murders, he denied all knowledge of them. Within hours of sending the carpet sample from Long's car to the forensics lab, the results were back. The fibres were an exact match to the ones found on the victims and on Lisa's clothes. There is no doubt whatever that those red carpet fibres were the link among a number of the killings and identified Bobby Joe as a serial killer. So they tell him about the carpet fibres um, and he realises that the game is up. So what he's doing here is he's trying to get back in control. So he confesses to the murders. He said, yes, it was me. Where is it you dropped the girl? Did you ever go out and scout them ahead of time or anything? Or just go around and find them? No, I never scouted them. While being interviewed, Long made another shocking admission. He revealed the location of another victim, 21-year-old waitress Vicky in Hillsborough County. But by that point, he was well aware that the scales of justice were certainly tipping against him. As if to dot the I's and cross the T's, Long drew them a map of where he dumped Vicky's body. If there was a final nail in his coffin, that was most certainly it. So he called me, and when I answered the phone, I could tell right away something was wrong in his voice. And he said, you know, the girls, I killed the girls in Tampa. And I said, you know, you're not funny. Don't mess with me like that. And then Bob asked me, he said to, um, call his parents and tell our children that he was killed in a car accident. And I said, I'm not gonna lie to our kids, you know, and, it, and I couldn't lie to them. But just six days after his arrest, another body was found in rural southern Hillsborough County, that of 18-year-old Artis, a prostitute long picked up in March 1984. He confessed to her murder, and it's believed that Artis was his first victim. Long had now claimed the lives of 10 women. On April the 22nd, 1985, in Dade City, Pasco County, Florida, Long was tried for the murder of 18-year-old waitress and sex worker Virginia. He was found guilty and was sentenced to die by electric chair. He was born in Pittsburgh, Kansas on March the 9th, the eldest of four boys born to William and Dorothea Rader. Rader was born in 1945, and he was one of several children within a, a very traditional nuclear family. His father was strict, but not particularly abusive, and many children grew up in households like this. He was upright, he was a scout, he was on all sorts of programs for good children. He had the ability to blend in. He wasn't bullied, for example, as a lot of killers are. To his friends and family, he was a model child, but in private, Raider began to show his true colours. 
Raider claims that when he was a youngster, he abused animals. So he hung a cat and he hung a dog. We do see, in quite a few cases of serial killers, animal harm in the background. As he went into puberty, he described himself as looking at girly mags, developing a fascination with underwear, and then significantly, and indeed deeply significant in his later crimes, was a fascination with bondage and sadomasochism. Having graduated from a local high school in Wichita, in 1965, Raider enrolled in Kansas Wesleyan College in Salina, 90 miles from home. However, he dropped out. In 1966, when Raider was 21, he joined the United States Air Force and remained in it for four years. He worked on systems. He was that kind of man. Systems are very much his kind of thing. He served abroad, sometimes in Europe. As far as we know, not a particularly distinguished career, but not a bad one. He returns to Wichita, Kansas, and marries a girl he was at school with. Raider marries and has two children. And from the outside, they do very much look like the respectable cereal box family, just like any other regular American family. In 1974, Raider suddenly and inexplicably changed from the respected X-Forces gentleman to a brutal evil killer. There has to be something that set him off, because that first explosion of violence was so shocking, so dramatic, so utterly horrifying that you couldn't possibly have imagined it was like going from naught to 60 in two seconds. A new family to the neighborhood became his first victims. The Otero family had recently moved to Wichita because they wanted a new start. This was the beginning of a, a new chapter in their lives. But unfortunately, this was to be very short-lived because one day the teenage children arrive home to the most horrendous scene. On January the 15th, 1974, Wichita police were called to the scene. Detective Tim Ralph was one of the task force investigators on the BTK case in later years. At the Otero house, they were actually called by the children. The three older children had come home, and uh, uh, they had found uh, their mother and father. They called, and the first responders, or the first people that arrived at that time, they, they went to the bedroom. They found the father and the mother. The scene they discovered was horrendous. Dennis Rader had broken into the family home and murdered everyone in the house in a way that would become his trademark. He binds, ties up husband and wife with a Venetian bind cord, suffocates them. The older children didn't want their younger siblings to come home and find this because they thought they were at school. And so the officers went to their elementary schools in the area and found that both of the younger siblings had not made it to school that day. When officers searched the house, it soon became clear that the parents weren't the only victims. Nine-year-old Joseph and his sister Josephine, 11, were both found murdered. Their 11-year-old daughter is found hanging in the basement, whether he killed her by hanging her or strangled her and then strung up the body. We have a situation where he's created elaborate knot work and hung the body up. It's almost like some sort of macabre art display. Raider appeared to have fixated on the younger daughter, Josephine, because he seems to have spent the most time with her body. She was the prize, and the others were just obstacles that he had to get out of the way. He kills the boy, ties him up, leaves on the floor of his bedroom, again suffocated. Raider had killed four members of the Otero family, 38-year-old Joseph, 33-year-old Julie, nine-year-old Joseph Jr., and 11-year-old Josephine. The Otero case provided an overall mindset of this person, that he 
certainly was into some kind of minding fantasy. The way Raider had killed the family showed the beginnings of what would become his modus operandi. The police found semen at the scene, so there was clearly a sexual element to this offending. And they also discovered that the faces of some of the victims were quite bloated, which suggests that the killer strangled them and then stopped strangling them and then strangled them again. So literally holding them on the edge of life and death, watching the life drain out of them and then giving it back. So having that power over somebody's survival or somebody's demise is something that this killer very much enjoyed. This was not, sadly, the act of a madman. It was the first of a series of killings in Wichita that would come to terrify the town. In January, they have the Otero killings. In April, they have Catherine's killing and Kevin's attack. They have no idea what they have on their hands. I don't imagine they get an awful lot of these kinds of attacks in Wichita. By the end of the year, the police thought they'd had a breakthrough in their investigation of the killings. In October 1974, and the police arrest three men on the suspicion of the Otero killings. Rada is furious. This is an outrage. Those were my killings. Nobody else. I'm not. I'm not a, this is it's not accept, absolutely not acceptable. You can almost hear him saying it to himself. This is not right. Incensed that his murders were being attributed to someone else, Raider wrote a letter to the local newspaper, the Wichita Eagle, and hid it inside a textbook at the Wichita Public Library. He then phoned the Otero murder hotline to describe where the letter could be found. In his letter, claiming credit for the Otero killings, it's not quite um, well written. It's uh, clumsy, misspelt, bad grammar, but the overall motive is absolutely clear. Raider attempted to justify the killings with the phrase, I can't stop it so the monster goes on and hurt me as well as society. Society can be thankful that there are ways for people like me to relieve myself at time by daydreams of some victims being torture and being mine. Understanding the fear he was causing, Raider went one step further and gave his murderous alter ego a name. He wanted a brand, he wanted an identity. He didn't just want to be a nameless killer. So he didn't want to get caught and he also wanted recognition for his crime. So he had to come up with a moniker, bind, torture, kill. Dennis Raider was to be known as BTK. And as he communicated with the press, Raider made a chilling threat that he was to strike again. Police still didn't have enough to make an arrest. They needed hard proof that Dennis Raider was the BTK killer. They have got no probable cause to demand a DNA sample from Raider, so they take the unlikely step of going to the hospital asking for a cervical smear that his daughter had given and comparing the DNA that they got from various crime scenes, the semen they'd found. And they find that it's extremely close. The match is in cream. Must be a family member. The police could finally move in. A large contingent of people <laughs> were sent toward Park City on uh, February the 25th of 2005. And at 12.15, he was taken into custody. Raider is finally arrested and is eventually charged with 10 murders, including the Oteros. The police had many crimes they suspected Raider and his alter ego BTK of committing. But at that time, only he knew the full extent of the truth. The interrogation was a delicate affair. We had broken up the case into several different sections, so we started to rotate in investigators and he would be more than a year and talked for almost 34 hours and he almost saw himself as an instructor of as he called it uh, you know the, the golden age of serial killing when they're done with the interviews i'm back from doing my search warrants he's in the interview room and they they put the, the vest on him and they're hooking him up with the shackles and belly chain and that kind of thing and i just kind of stuck my head in the door and said um 
it's nice to be able to put a face go along with the name that I found on the floppy disk. And he looks up and he's kind of got this, the shackles like that and looks up, so, oh, so you're the one, huh? And I said, yeah, I'm the one. So we uh, kind of joked back and forth. And he was, it was in good mood. He was joking and he said, oh, if I ever get out of here, I'm gonna have to find you and stuff your mouth full of a case of floppy disks. Finally, the infamous BTK was off the streets and in custody. So we, we took him over to the jail. Everybody in the holding cells and area in there knew that it happened. The cells in there are all glassed off, and so all the inmates in there, they all come up to the glass, and they're looking at the glass, and then they start pounding on the glass, chanting his name, chanting, you know, pounding on the glass, and BTK, BTK. And then he's got a big old smile, and he's got his hands there, he goes, two thumbs up, as he's two thumbs up to everybody chanting his name. So, I mean, he just loved that. On the 1st of March, 2005, Dennis Rader had been charged with the murders of the Otero family, Catherine Bright, Shirley Vian, Nancy Fox, Maureen Hedge, Vicky Wegerly, and Dolores E. Davis. We have no problem whatsoever with uh, any of it. So it's just our house, and we made it home, and we're, we're pretty happy with it. Uh, you still get people walking by asking, you know, how could we be crazy enough to buy this house and stuff. But between the two of us, we've made it into a home. Yeah, think. And, and, you know, we tried to um, make it more comfortable and, and try to diffuse the whole mystique around it. And, yeah, we, we were doing our best. She was a hardened criminal in the body of a little old lady. Yeah, she was a hard, hard person. Pure evil. Despite the renovations, John still remembers the home as the boarding house where nine people lost their lives. This is what I would call the death room. This is where Dorothea would bring her victims after giving them the drug and alcohol combination and then bringing them in here and leaving them on the floor until she could prepare them at a later time. And when I pull the carpet back, the odor was so overwhelming, it was unbelievable. But I knew and recognized that smell. And it was the smell of putrefied body fluid that had seeped through the wooden floor from her victims who had laid there for anywhere from two to four weeks, probably. The day after finding the first body, Saturday, November the 12th, 1988, John vividly recalls the moment he realized the little old lady living at 1426 F Street was not what she seemed. I looked up at one point onto that balcony and Dorothea was standing there looking right straight down at me, knowing that probably within minutes, I was gonna uncover that second body and sidetracked me from digging in order to walk her over to the motel and it's there she made her escape. Puente would remain a wanted fugitive for five days, but her story begins over 85 years ago. She was born Dorothea Gray in San Bernardino County, California, on January the 9th, 1929. She was one of several children. She lost both of her parents quite early on. She spent time in an orphanage. She was kind of passed from pillar to post quite a lot. So she didn't form those stable, secure attachments with her caregivers that many of us do. And I think that went on to shape the person that she became. Dorothea, you know, lived a very difficult early childhood. She was deprived in substantial ways. She didn't have loving parents. She had to scavenge for food. By the mid-1960s, Dorothea had been married three times and taken on the name of her third husband, Puente. She had already served time in prison for forging checks and had found a new way to earn money. She starts to, to get involved in sex work, selling her body um, to, to basically put clothes on her back and feed herself. So she is living this, this quite kind of feral existence. Now, here's an individual for whom violence and abuse was just normal for her. If we look back at her childhood experiences, they're certainly not normal and warm and, and loving. They are quite brutal and quite cold. So this is the only thing that, that she knows. It's, it's those basic emotions and those basic instincts. And then after becoming a prostitute, she discovered this occupation of being a caregiver, which requires minimal qualifications. 
and all of a sudden, a world was opened up to her. In 1981, Puente began renting an apartment at 1426 F Street in downtown Sacramento. She took on the role of caretaker for the other tenants in the Victorian boarding house. Soon after, Puente met 61-year-old Ruth Monroe. Ruth's son, Bill Clausen, remembers his mother fondly. She was great. I mean, she was my mom. I'm going to say she's great. Uh, but she was. She, she brought up five kids after my father passed away, and I thought she did a good job. We met Dorothea through a gentleman that my mom met while she was working, and he kept asking her out, and he, she finally went out with him, and then they started seeing each other, and he introduced her to Dorothea. During their friendship, Dorothea decided she wanted to open a restaurant. And my mom wasn't working anymore, and um, my mom had a little bit of money. So she ended up opening the little cafe at the Round Corner Bar. Ruth ended up marrying Harold, the man who'd introduced her to Puente. But soon he was diagnosed with cancer, and living full-time in a hospital. Ruth didn't want to live alone, and Puente had an idea. She could live with her at 1426 F Street. It turned out to be a fatal decision. We moved her in there on Easter Sunday, 1982, and she died April, April 26th, two weeks later. Um, I saw my mom every day from the time I moved her in there. I stopped by there on my way home from work. And the last three days of her life, um, she seemed like she was getting sick. And when I went there, I had noticed that she had a drink in her hand and my mom didn't drink. So I asked her, I said, what's that? And she said, it was a drink that Dorothea fixed to, to calm her nerves. I said, fine, you know, I didn't think anything of it because I knew they were friends and, okay, fine. But Ruth deteriorated so badly over the next few days that the next time Bill went to visit her, she was almost catatonic. Mom was laying there. I sat next to her and touched her and told her, I said, Dorothea's taking care of you, you'll be fine. And uh, she had a tear coming out of her eye and that was it. She didn't say anything. She just laid there. The next morning, I got a call from my brother telling me that mom was, mom was dead. Went over there. She had already been taken away by the coroner's wagon, and Dorothea had said that she committed suicide. So immediately, I stop. I yell to my commander, we have another one. And he runs over, and the first thing he asks is, where's Dorothea? It was a good question. Where was Dorothea Puente? A second body had been found buried in her yard, and she was nowhere to be seen. She wasn't at the hotel having a coffee. It had all been a ruse so that she could make an escape. Dorothea Puente was on the run. On Saturday, November the 12th, 1988, a police forensic team were digging up the yard of a boarding house in Sacramento, California. They had just unearthed a second body. Dorothea Puente, the 59-year-old landlady of 1426 F Street, had left the house and headed to a nearby hotel to have a coffee. But detectives were now very keen to speak with her. I said I took her and watched her go to the coffee shop. She's supposedly over there at the hotel. So then another detective came and found out by speaking with uh, the person at the counter in there that in fact, Dorothea had come into the hotel, walked through the lobby, went to a payphone, picked up a payphone and called, apparently called a taxi cab because the cab arrived and took off. Puente had absconded and detectives had no idea where she was headed. And so at that time, we called in the FBI and, um, you know, enlisted the help of other uh, resources and outside agencies. 
and trying to locate her because that is what was key right now, is to try to find her as fast as we could. Back at 1426 F Street, one of the many people who had gathered to watch the dig had given some important information to Deputy Coroner Laura Santos. He told the story that um, he had dug holes in this yard for Dorothy and she paid him cash and then she, and he, she just told him she was burying trash. So he came in and pointed out where he had dug holes. Over the next three days, the excavation of the yard continued. Just as we kept digging, we kept finding bodies and more bodies. And it just seemed endless. Whatever we took down, whatever we moved, wherever we were digging, we'd find a body. It was just unbelievable. She put seven people in this small yard, and there wasn't even a witness to any of these burials, not one. The seventh and final body was found on Monday, the 14th of November. It was buried right in front of the house, just feet from the sidewalk. Well, she was kind of bundled up in almost like a, a scrunched up seated position, but she was missing her head, hands and feet. I went through every flower pot and emptied them out to make sure that we weren't missing anything, but those appendages were never found. To this day, we've never recovered the head, hands, or feet. Their whereabouts, it's anybody's guess. If the walls in this home could talk, we would probably be horrified. Three days after the discovery of the seventh body, Thursday the 17th of November, Dorothea Puente was finally found. She had been spotted by a man in a bar almost 400 miles from Sacramento in Los Angeles. He goes home, and while he's watching TV, he sees her on TV as being wanted on the news. So he calls LAPD, gives the information, I was just having drinks with this person. The man told the police which hotel Puente was staying in, and she was promptly arrested. John Cabrera immediately flew down to John Wayne Airport in nearby Santa Ana. We landed. LAPD pulled up out on the tarmac. We got out of the plane, and uh, there she was. They had her in cuffs. You know, we ceremoniously uh, walked over, and uh, they transferred a her to me. I asked her, you know, are you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. And then out of nowhere, she just says, Mr. Cabrera, I, I'm sorry. John Wayne Gacy was born in Chicago, Illinois on the 17th of March, 1942. The second of three children, Gacy had a difficult upbringing. His father was an alcoholic who was reportedly both mentally and physically abusive to his children and their mother. His father spent uh, apparently all of Gacy's childhood demeaning him and physically punishing him and telling him how stupid and worthless and effeminate he was. Gacy's childhood friend, Barry Bashelli remembers the physical abuse he suffered at the hands of his father. If Johnny was two minutes late, no food. So a lot of times Johnny ate at our house and stayed at our house overnight. He used to take Johnny when he was sitting at the kitchen table and he would take his fist and hit Johnny in the face. The father is a very significant figure in the genesis of Gacy's terrible deeds. For to my mind, Gacy was always trying to satisfy his father, whom he never could. He was beaten repeatedly by his father with belts, with brooms. At one stage, he was knocked out by him. These people grow up with such a malignant view of the world and of human relationships and feeling that human relationships are not based on love and trust and respect, you know, that they're all based on 
exploitation and cruelty and inflicting pain. Gacy was a sickly child. He suffered from a heart condition, limiting his involvement in sports activities and consequently alienating him from his peers. Aged 11, an accident in a playground led to his teenage years being blighted by blackouts and hospital visits. At that time, the swings were wooden base swings with heavy chains coming down. Johnny went to grab it and the swing clipped him right across the forehead and knocked him to the ground. By 1966, 24-year-old Gacy was married and had relocated to the city of Waterloo, 300 miles west of Chicago in the neighboring state of Iowa. Well, Gacy got married and life from the outside appeared to be relatively normal. He had quite a good job. Um, his wife had two children. So they appeared to be the, the, the typical cereal box American nuclear family. And Gacy wasn't just a, a regular family man. He was also quite active in the, the local chamber of commerce and he played quite an active role. And he was a real figure in the local community. Gacy had started to build the perfect life for himself but he was concealing a dark secret. He developed an unhealthy sexual interest in young boys. There was a son of a fellow JC member um, who he, he lured back to his home and he sexually assaulted. So he's, he's abusing power. He's getting into these positions of trust and he's taking advantage. And, and that's a theme that's gonna continue for him. And then when the kid revealed this to his father, and Gacy was arrested for it. Uh, Gacy hired another teenager to intimidate this kid, to lure this kid into some remote place and spray mace in his eyes and beat him up and warn him against testifying in Gacy's case. Despite Gacy's efforts, his victim still testified, but there wasn't conclusive proof of an attack. Therefore, police were only able to charge him with sodomy of the 15-year-old boy. He pleaded guilty to one count of sodomy, thinking he would get uh, a very, very mi minimal sentence. Uh, but the judge threw the book at him, and he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. On the 3rd of December, 1968, Gacy was sent to Anamosa State Penitentiary. Gacy actually handcuffs himself and turns around and struggles with the handcuffs, and then turns back and he holds the handcuffs up. and. Peace is pretty amazed at that, and he said, well, that's, that's neat, how'd you do that? So Gacy says, well, here, you handcuff yourself, and I'll show you how to do that. So Peace handcuffs himself, and he struggles, and he struggles, and he struggles, and he looks at Gacy, and he says, now, what's the trick to this? And Gacy reaches in his pocket and pulls out a key to the handcuffs, and he says, the trick is, you gotta have this key. This handcuff trick was part of an horrific yet clinical MO. Gacy, throughout all of the 33 killings, had developed a method of killing these young kids. He would uh, pick up these victims. Some were kids who worked from him, but most were teenage runaways, you know, and bringing them back to his house and giving them drinks. He would sort of trick them into handcuffing themselves or being handcuffed. Gacy would use chloroform to subdue his victims. Uh, chloroform's an, an old-fashioned anaesthetic, really, so it gets into your lungs and it just renders you unconscious very effectively. He did what he called a rope trick. And when he had these young kids incapacitated like that, he would slip a rope over their neck, a knotted rope like a loop, and then put the stick in the back like a tourniquet and he would slowly turn the tourniquet. And he said he had it perfected so well that he knew exactly how the body would react to each half turn. Putting a ligature around the neck, the first thing it's going to block is the blood vessels, so it prevents blood getting to the brain, prevents it getting back to the body from the brain. It's gonna be very uncomfortable and it can even render you unconscious in a small number of seconds and he went into detail on how he would torture these young men. And he, in fact, did double and triple murders. He would incapacitate two or three people at a time and kill one person in front of the other victims and then continue to kill the other victims. And he seemed to be pretty proud of that. But we used that to our advantage to keep him talking, and he described every killing um, 
to a T exactly how it happened, all 33. As the news broke across the country, one shocked viewer who'd unknowingly experienced Gacy's MO firsthand was his ex-employee, Tony Antonucci. Whilst working for PDM, Tony had accidentally got a nail stuck in his foot. John took me and I got a tetanus shot and, uh, and took me home. And he came over later that evening to check on if I was okay or that was the the theory, but he also had, you know, some wine and we were drinking and he was kind of joking around. It was probably 10, 10 30 at night. I was a high school wrestler. And he said, Oh, you know, you know, you're a big wrestler guy, and he started wrestling around with me. He got uh, my left arm and he got it behind me and I felt him put a handcuff on it. I kept flailing my right hand around so that he he couldn't get my right arm, but eventually he did get a hold of my right arm and he knocked me down to the floor with my hands behind me. He left the room for a few minutes and I realized that if I pulled really hard on my right hand, that I could pull my hand through the handcuff. I could get it out. By pretending he was still handcuffed, Tony was able to catch Gacy unawares when he returned and turn the situation to his advantage. I took the handcuff that I had gotten out of and I handcuffed him on one of his wrists and I reached into his pocket, got the key, and I handcuffed him behind his back, laying face down. He goes, you're the only one that not only got out of the handcuffs, you got them on me. And I didn't know what that meant. I thought that this was some type of test that he had performed before. And I let him stay handcuffed for 10 or 15 minutes before I let him out of the handcuffs. And, you know, he had previously agreed that when I let him up, he would leave. And he did. Tony had no idea just how close he'd come to being another victim of this deadly killer. On the 21st of December, 1978, they searched Gacy's home on West Somerdale Avenue for the second time. When they executed that search warrant, they went in the crawl space, and the very first shovel that they dug, they found human remains. Police had finally unearthed the secrets that Gacy had thought would stay buried forever. So they immediately called me, let me know that um, there was human remains in a crawl space, and at that time I arrested uh, John Gacy for murder. Gacy says he wants to confess, but really he wants to confess to the surveillance team, both myself and my partner and the other team. And now all of a sudden he's got an audience again, and he's on top of the world. And he knows he can't get out of it at this point, and so he might as well just divulge everything that actually happened. Gacy told detectives he was willing to draw a map of the burial site beneath his home. I gave him a pen and he started right up, he squared it off in the thing and he started, well, this was a double and this was a triple and this was the first guy with a, put an X on it. Went around the whole crawl space with these places where the body was buried. I mean, they were digging with spoons and everything, but they obviously identified where all the bodies were and they did an overlay of where the bodies were actually found compared to that diagram that he made. And it was unbelievable, it was right on the money. In total, 27 bodies were discovered in Gacy's crawl space. It wouldn't take long for news of this horrific discovery to filter out to the wider world. Then the arrest came down, and that was the headline on the local papers, everything, how many bodies they took out of Gacy's basement. Well, you know, when Gacy's crimes were uncovered, he entered into the record books, you know, as the America's most prolific serial murderer. The notion that this, you know, pudgy, normal-seeming, decent, regular, ordinary guy was living in this horror house, you know, that was just suffused with the stench of death, and that there were the rotting bodies of 27 young men in his crawl space, bringing home and torturing young boys right in the midst, you know, of all his neighbors and then going off to work the next day. When we booked him for murder, 
We asked Gacy uh, where, where he was born, and Gacy looked at us and said, I was born in a state of confusion. And he smiled like that, and we captured the photo. In total, Gacy confessed to the murder of 33 young men and boys between 1972 and 1978. This killer story begins in 1949. Robert Andrew Badella Jr. was born on January the 31st, the first of two sons. He was raised in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, in a strict Catholic household. His father worked at the Ford Motor Company. His mother was a homemaker, so they were very much the traditional American nuclear family. Badella was a shy, intelligent child who struggled to fit in at school. He was bullied by his peers because he did stand out as different. He wore very thick glasses. He went to the algebra club. He collected stamps. So there was that sense in which he always felt that isolation from his peer group. Then, in his mid-teens, his world was turned upside down. Badella's father died of a heart attack when he was 16, and this did have quite a significant impact on him because his mother remarried and she went on to set up another home with somebody else. And I think that Badella really did feel a sense of rejection here. He was part of his mother's past. The world had moved on and he was left behind. Around the same time, Badella had been working part-time. There's a particular incident that Badella later recalls that is potentially significant. Badella claims that he was raped when he was an adolescent at a restaurant where he worked. Badella never reported the incident to the police. In 1967, after graduating high school, Badella enrolled in Kansas City Art Institute. At this time, he'd begun exploring his sexuality. He'd realized that he was certainly gay. And it was pretty apparent to him that his father would not have approved of that. He's also been brought up in the Catholic Church, so I think there is very much an underlying sense of shame there. By 1969, Badella had begun to experiment with drugs. He quit college after tutors failed to understand his twisted art projects, often involving live animals. He may have been a bit nerdy to look at, and a bit strange, but he was clearly talented. In need of a job, Badella put his talents to a new use. Badella started working as a short order chef and quickly rose. He developed quite a good reputation in the local community as people were talking about the food that he was making. And he bought his own house. He had quite a bright future. He really was a figure that commanded respect in the local community. By his mid to late 20s, Badella had also developed a passion for collecting, and this hobby soon became a business in its own right. He was obviously a very good chef, but it wasn't his only talent. He also collected art and antiquities. This was a man of quite considerable taste, working at some of the best restaurants, and at the same time operating a boutique called Bob's Bazaar, Bizarre, selling art and antiquities. The boutique became Badella's full-time job, and he began to rent out rooms in his home to help make ends meet. Some of those lodgers were vulnerable young men who'd received bed and board in return for carrying out jobs around the house and at his antique shop. People who'd run away from home, young gay men, uh, couples, uh, rather a sort of benevolent figure. Badella had developed a sick taste for torture and murder. And after getting away with his first crime, he began to look for ever-increasing, horrific ways to get his sexual kicks. Nine months after he tortured and murdered his first victim, 19-year-old Jerry Howell, Robert Badella took his next victim. So Robert Sheldon was somebody who had stayed with Badella before at his house. So there was a degree of trust in this relationship, and it was trust that Badella really did take advantage of. On April the 10th, 20-year-old drug addict Robert Sheldon appeared at Badella's door looking for somewhere to stay after an argument with his girlfriend. Shortly after he set foot inside, Badella put his sadistic plan into action. 
He keeps him for four days. Automatically, you know that this is going to be somebody who's in distress. He starts to escalate his cruelty with this victim. He injects drain cleaner into his eyes. He fills his ears with corking material. There's damage to the hands from piano wire. He's hitting him with a rubber mallet. All of these things are acts of cruelty and they would not kill you. It's subduing the victim. He did some horrendous things to him, but the thing that really stood out for me was the tattoo that he gave this victim on his shoulder. He was almost branding this man, saying, you are mine, I own you and I possess you. Like he had with his first victim, Badella documented his methods by writing intricate notes. This time, he went one step further and included himself in the photographs with his tormented victim. He wanted an absolute record of everything he'd done. It was a certain amount of pride. There is no doubt whatever that that's what was in his mind. He documented it because he was proud of it. On the 14th of April, Badella arrived home to find a workman he knew on the roof of his property. Concerned that he'd be discovered, he decided to kill Robert. He becomes quite paranoid because he knows this guy. So Badella takes matters into his own hands and he goes and places a plastic bag over the head of his victim, essentially ending his life. Badella began his ritual act of cutting up his victim's body piece by piece. Dismembering a body is not the easiest thing in the world to do, but if you have some knowledge, like a surgeon or a chef, then you can quite effectively dismember a body, and that makes it easier to dispose of. This horrific expertise in chopping up bodies later earned Badella the nickname the Kansas City Butcher. In keeping with his obsession with collecting, this time Badella decided he wanted to keep a souvenir of his actions. Badella second victim, Robert, he dismembered the body and cut off the head. But this time, he didn't put it all into black garbage bags and put it out for the garbage truck. He kept the head first in the freezer in his house, and he later buried it in the garden where it decomposed as a kind of trophy of the killing. And this is really significant for me because the head is what gives somebody their identity. It's what makes them a human. I think by keeping the head, Badella wants to be able to say, I'm the one that has depersonalized this individual. I'm the one that's dehumanized them. Badella had now tortured and murdered two people without being caught. On March the 29th, 1988, he picked up 22-year-old male prostitute Christopher Bryson and took him back to his house. So Christopher Bryson was wandering the streets when Robert Badella picks him up, and he offers him a beer, and they, they drive around in his car for a while. Badella then says, well, come back to my house, and you can have a beer there. So Christopher agrees, and they go back. He was brought home to provide sexual favors for Badella, and was told to go upstairs as soon as they got there. As Bryson mounted the stairs and started walking up, he was struck from behind and rendered unconscious. With his victim sedated and held captive, Badella began his deadly ritual. Once again, he is tortured, he is salted, he is given bleach in the eyes, but this time it's swabbed onto the eyeballs rather than injected in. That would probably be even more painful there are many nerve endings on the globe of the eye which would react very badly to the bleach. Repeatedly electrocuted, raped and injected with a cocktail of sedatives, Christopher remained a submissive captive for four days. But on the morning of April the 2nd, 1988, when Badella had left for work, Christopher managed to set himself free. He finds some matches, and he's able to actually burn through the robes that Badella had restrained him with. So he flees the house wearing only a dog collar. He must have been an extraordinary sight, a naked man wearing a dog collar. He runs across the street, meets a meter reader, 
who's going to a house. They knock on the door. The house owner is astonished, opens the door, astonished, won't let Christopher into the house, but does call the police. Roy Orth was a sergeant with the Kansas City Police Department when they received the call. Chris had been severely physically abused and was asking for help. District officers got there, found this was probably going to be some kind of an unlawful restraint uh, abduction situation and called the Sex Crimes Child Abuse Unit and our detective responded. Rick Holtzclaw was the assistant prosecutor for the Sex Crimes Unit in Kansas City. Roy Orth called me and said, we need you. And I said, you don't need me today. Um, and he said, no, I'm telling you, we need you on this one. He may have told me briefly what it was, that we had someone who had escaped naked with a dog collar. It became evident that they were going to need some assistance. So I went to the home on that Saturday afternoon, and we began the investigation, getting search warrants. And that's how it began. In just over a three-year period, Bedella had held brutally raped, tortured, and killed six men and got away with it. Unknown to the police, they were about to uncover the shocking crimes committed by a sadistic serial killer, Robert Bedella. Troy Cole was the lead detective in charge of the case. I first became aware of him uh, April 2nd, 1988. Um, I was working in the homicide unit. It was a Saturday and uh, was called out in regards to a sodomy. The guy alleged that he had been kidnapped and held captive for a number of days, and I was the duty sergeant, which meant that I handled the homicides, the robbery, and the sex crimes for that particular day. Christopher managed to escape and flag down a passerby. That's what brought us to the residence. The traumatized victim recounted his ordeal and gave police the name and address of his captor, when Berdella arrived home that evening, the police were waiting for him.